YouTube, if your reviewers are watching this, nothing in this video is going to be showing the actual modifications of any firearms. We are going to be discussing the physics behind recoil and how you can properly manage that. Nothing in here is going to be illegal. All firearms shown are going to be in safe locations like a shooting range. All firearms in this video where I'm talking about it are going to be unloaded. So every time that I've posted a video of me shooting this AR, it seems like the comments are filled with things like, oh, why does your gun have no recoil? Or is that a 22? And just generally people being confused about how this gun has such little recoil. Now, at the end of the day, this is still a 223-556 AR-15. And while skill is definitely an important factor, there are some things that you can do when it comes to setting up your AR-15 that can help you have a more manageable recoil and have a gun that operates more reliably and just better and more enjoyable to shoot. And it's not just throw on a muzzle brake. You will notice that this gun does not have a muzzle brake on it. It actually has what was what would be considered a flash hider. You don't need to put a muzzle brake on your gun to make it recoil less, but at the end of the day, skill will always beat equipment if the equipment is still moderately okay. So today we're just going to be talking about the equipment because that's obviously way more fun to talk about. If you want to talk about skill and training, uh, someone else, you got to learn from someone else. I am not going to teach you how to do that stuff. But first, I gotta say thank you to the sponsor of today's video. It is Manscaped. I'm very happy to have them on board. If you look at the analytics of my channel, you'll see that about 98% of you are men. So for the 2% of women watching this, I'm sorry. But for the men out there, now I know based on the comments, the people in my Discord, that there are two types of people who watch these videos. Hardcore red-blooded Americans like you and me, and weebs. And both of those groups of people would highly benefit from the occasional trimming of their, uh, the boys. Now, I care about your your nuts. I care about your nut health. And they have a wide variety of products. I'm actually really happy with how they turned out. I thought I was going to have to turn down this ad after using the products, but they're as hyped up as they are. Um, I did not hurt myself during the testing process of this ad read. So thank you to Manscaped. If you use the coupon code link down below, it will give you a bunch of free stuff as well as a discount on whatever you purchase there. Thank you to Manscaped for supporting this video. Let's get back into it. So before we can really talk about the gear, we got to kind of talk about some core concepts when it comes to the physics of AR-15 recoil. Now, bear with me. I'm going to try to do this as fast as possible. Now, when you fire a round out of a out of a gun, you are throwing a projectile which has mass at a very high speed. Now, if you remember high school physics, equal and opposite reactions. So as much force is going forward, that is the same amount of force that is going to be exerted backwards. So that leads us with a problem. That force is translated into what we perceive as recoil in the form of movement backwards and rise upwards. So how do we control and mitigate that as best as possible? Now, one of the biggest factors that we have over the control of the recoil is the actual weight of the firearm. This firearm weighs a little bit over eight pounds unloaded. Now, I've also owned AR-15s that have weighed under four pounds or under four and a half pounds. The difference between a gun that weighs about eight and a half pounds versus a gun that weighs about four and a half pounds, you will notice the felt recoil significantly more on a lighter gun. A common example that I have for people is you have someone shoot a very small pistol and then you have someone shoot a very large pistol, both in the same caliber. You're going to feel that felt recoil on the smaller gun a whole lot more. And that's because there's less mass and less momentum to the actual gun. So everything is translated more into you much more quickly because the force on the gun on a lighter gun sends it back just a little bit quicker and a little bit sharper. So when you're building your gun, you can kind of uh, play with the actual weight. Now, a lighter weight gun is going to handle as far as maneuverability 
much better than a gun that weighs 15 pounds unloaded. So there's a balance to it. You don't want to get super light unless you're looking purely for a competition gun or going so light just for the sake of having a lightweight gun. But going so heavy would make the gun unwieldy, especially if you're going to be planning on using this gun for any sort of defensive role or hard use. So don't go too light. Don't go too heavy. This gun is kind of right around in that sweet spot on the heavier end where it's about eight pounds eight and a half pounds so it's gonna have a lot less felt recoil than some of those lightweight ar-15s you might see on the market now because these guns are semi-auto that's a huge benefit when it comes to recoil control when it's semi-auto you are going to have a significant decrease in felt recoil compared to a gun that's bolt action that's because Remember when we talked about equal and opposite forces? When that bullet leaves the barrel, it's putting all that force into the gun. On a semi-automatic gun, you have the bolt carrier group and various other moving parts inside of the gun that has to move backwards as well. So some of that force that's being exerted on the bullet is actually translated into moving mass into the back of the gun. That's good, but it can also be bad if done improperly. And that's why when you shoot a 308 bolt action, you might notice that it feels significantly harsher on the recoil than a AR-10 or a similar firearm that's semi-auto because some of that force that's being exerted on the bullet is going backwards and being slowed down. So it's the same amount of force typically that's being put back but because it's not immediately going into you, it's acting on the bolt carrier group, which is moving backwards at a slower rate or at a delayed period of time, it increases the period of time that you actually feel that recoil, making it feel significantly softer. Think of it like this. If I were to punch you really hard, that would feel a lot sharper than if I were to put the same amount of force into a slow push onto you. Now, it being semi-auto, we can tune it to our liking as far as how fast it recoils and various aspects like that. And while that can reduce the felt recoil, if it's done improperly or if your gun is considered overgassed, it can actually negate some of those benefits by increasing the wear and tear, decreasing the reliability in some instances, and making the recoil more sharp and harsh. Because when this bolt moves back and forth, if you are cycling it too quickly because it is overgassed, meaning more gas is going into it, it is going to actually feel sharper than it really needs to be. Now, first, let's take a look and determine is your gun overgassed and can we reduce the amount of gas needed or the cyclic rate of the gun so that it can decrease the felt recoil? We're going to be looking at this diagram here. Now, this is a pretty common diagram that's been floating around on the internet when it comes to AR-15s for a long time. If your gun, when it fires, is ejecting forward or 3 o'clock and forward, you're going to want to try to decrease the cyclic rate because your gun is considered overgassed. If it is ejecting straight back or more towards the 6 o'clock direction, it is going to be considered undergassed. Would I rather have a gun that is slightly overgassed versus a gun that is way undergassed? Yes. However, most guns have a perfect cyclic rate and a perfect gas level that puts the ejection pattern of a round at about 4 o'clock. 3.30 to 4 o'clock is about what you're looking for when the gun ejects. So if you're shooting the rounds that you're typically going to be using for defensive use and your gun is ejecting at about 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock, great. Your gun is gassed really well and the things that we would be talking about when it comes to the gas system aren't really going to affect you. Your main choices for reducing the felt recoil are going to be, first of all, skill, maybe adding a muzzle brake if that's something you're interested in, or having the gun be heavier. Really, skill is the true king, but we're talking about gear today because gear is fun. Because the current state of the AR-15 manufacturing market is they tend to overgas their guns. And the reason they do that is because they want anybody to be able to just pick up any random ammunition from a gun show that's way underloaded and pick up the heaviest bolt and buffer and all that combination, and it should be able to cycle anything. And that's great when it comes to reliability, sometimes, but you don't actually need to put all that excess wear and tear on your gun because there is a sweet spot in the middle that I think most manufacturers should really be shooting for. I understand why some budget manufacturers 
might go for the route of overgassing their guns, but do they really need to? I'm of the opinion that they don't, and I think that they're going far too far into the overgassed realm for the sake of reliability when they could make their guns significantly more ple pleasing and pleasurable to shoot, which would reduce the felt recoil, increase the ability that you can perform with that gun at any given skill level, and reduce the wear and tear on the parts over time. So for me, I think that they really should be doing that, but it doesn't seem like everyone else is on the same page. It seems like it's just me and gun thoughts over here screaming about overgassing. So when it comes to the gas system, what can we actually change? We're going to talk about this in the context of you already have a firearm and you want to tune it further. Unfortunately, most barrel manufacturers are drilling the gas port on their gun too large, meaning that more gas is coming back, cycling into the bolt carrier group, pushing back on the buffer, pushing back on the spring, and it's just going way too fast. That's a problem because you cannot add material back into that gas port, which leaves you with one option. If your gun is overgassed and you want to affect the amount of gas flow, the best option that you have is not an adjustable gas block, in my opinion. Adjustable gas blocks can be great for the people that are running competition guns or maybe just a range gun, but when it comes to defensive firearms, I'm not a huge fan of adjustable gas blocks because I think it adds an extra point of failure when in reality you could just do something significantly cheaper with less things that could go wrong. One of those options is by purchasing what is called a BRT EZ Tune gas tube. I'm going to have links to this stuff down in the description. It's going to be in a Reddit link. You'll take that link over and then you'll be able to see more of the products that I'm going to link down below, but I can't actually put those in the YouTube description. So what the BRT Easy Tune gas tube does is it actually reduces the inside diameter of the gas tube, restricting flow slightly, making up for the fact that your gas port on your barrel might just be fucking hogged out way too wide. This is an excellent option because it's simple. All you do is pop out the pin on your gas block, throw in your new gas tube, put the pin back in, and it's sturdy. The reason I prefer this over the adjustable gas block is because it's just simply more reliable, in my opinion. I know some people are gonna comment down below how they love adjustable gas blocks, and that's fine. It's just not for me. Now, the next step that you could mess with the gas system is at the bolt carrier group. Now, a typical M16 style bolt carrier group is going to be what I would recommend. If you're building a super light gun, you can go with one of these skeletonized bolt carrier groups. I personally would not recommend that, again, unless it's going to be a competition gun or a lightweight gun for the sake of making it lightweight. If you're just looking for a general duty gun, range gun, or home defense firearm, end of the world gun, buy a standard bolt carrier group. Don't go with any of the lightweight stuff. The lightweight bolt carrier groups are nice, but they do require an adjustable gas block to function properly, because if you get a lighter bolt carrier group without restricting the gas flow, you're gonna have a bolt carrier group that, gum, that comes backwards so much faster and so much harsher, which is gonna then increase the felt recoil. In the lower receiver of the firearm, you have a buffer tube. Inside it is a buffer weight and a spring. This is what stops the bolt as it comes to the rear and sends it back forward. Now, me personally, I'm a big fan of buying an H2 buffer. And now what that means is it's a heavier buffer. The reason I do that is because it helps reduce the speed at which the bolt carrier comes back and helps lock it forward a little bit more positively. The typical buffers that you're going to find in most kits, in most ARs, is a carbine buffer, otherwise known as an H0. You can also get an H1 buffer or an H buffer, and you can also get an H2, H3, H4. As the number gets bigger, the weight gets heavier. Going too heavy can cause the gun to not have enough gas to cycle backwards, which defeats the purpose. Ideally, what you would do is restrict the gas flow, which is a little bit more complicated for some people. So for me, I generally recommend working from the rear by getting a slightly heavier H2 or H buffer if your gun is overgassed, or going with a Springco spring. Springco is a excellent manufacturer of springs for the AR-15 products. Springs, you kind of think of them as like simple, easy products, but they're actually pretty complicated. And if you want to do them right and do them well, 
you're gonna to wanna to go with a reputable manufacturer. And that's why Springco is my go-to. Again, link in the description will take you to a Reddit post where you will be able to see a link from Springco. If you wanna read a big ass text document discussing the gas mass and uh, velocity and whatnot, they can discuss and you can read through that and learn everything you will ever need to know about gas cycling optimization. But in this, I just wanted to make it a little bit more palatable. Springco, a manufacturer that is very reputable, very well known in the industry, they say that changing the spring weight and keeping the light buffer is the optimal way to go. And they're probably right. However, I've just had great luck by using H2 buffers in most of my guns. But some people have had great luck by using enhanced stiffness springs from Springco. In fact, in my LaRue gun, um, that one there, which I'm going to be doing a review on soon, LaRue actually ships it with a Springco standard weight spring, which is a white spring. You can go one step up and get a blue spring, and that's actually what I did for that gun. I found that with the blue spring, with a standard carbine weight buffer, I was getting perfect ejection at four o'clock with my full power um, defensive rounds. And so for me, I think that's perfect. Could it have some sort of issue cycling steel? Maybe, but it's a very easy fix to just keep an extra spring around when I want to shoot cheap, very low velocity, very weak rounds. Changing the gas tube is a little bit more permanent. Changing the gas port is a little bit more permanent. Adding an adjustable gas block, not ideal in my opinion. Feel free to discuss down below why you disagree with that. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of people disagreeing. But going with a heavier spring or a heavier buffer is an easy option that can be swapped out in seconds. So for me, that's why I prefer to do that. Because if I want to shoot mostly brass out of my gun, but then occasionally I want to shoot steel case, which is loaded a lot weaker, I can easily just take out the optimized system for what I want it to be used for defensively, meaning that this gun is set up perfectly how I would want it for defensive use, but then when I want to shoot cheap steel ammo at the range, I can just pop open the rear of the gun, pop out the spring, put a new one in, 10 seconds later, I'm shooting steel case no problem. This gun can cycle steel, however, sometimes when the gun is dirtier, it doesn't always lock back on the last round on an empty magazine. And for me, that's fine because it helps me practice some tap rack bangs when I'm using really cheap, really weak ammunition. I've actually gone one step further on this gun and I've installed what is referred to as an Voltor A5 buffer system. What this does is mimic the length that you would see on a traditional M16 or A2 style firearm, which lengthens the actual spring buffer and buffer tube, giving the gun a smoother recoil impulse. When you see on forums people talking about, oh man, I just love shooting my 20 inch A2 AR with a rifle gas system and a rifle buffer. They talk about that because it shoots so smoothly and they do. And what the A5 system does while being more expensive at about $90 for the kit, it does actually reduce the felt recoil significantly, allowing you to shoot a lot softer. Is it necessary? No. But I think if you're building a gun from the ground up, it might be worth considering going with the A5 kit. Now, muzzle brakes. As you saw on my gun, I don't actually have a muzzle brake on that gun. I'm using a flash hider. Now, have I shot a lot out of that gun and am I pretty good with that gun? Absolutely. A muzzle brake can reduce and will reduce the felt recoil and the muzzle rise on your gun significantly, making it much easier for you to shoot faster and flatter. Great for the range, great for competition, great for general use. However, they are significantly louder and much more concussive, especially to the people around you, which for me isn't the hugest issue because I'm the one behind the gun. But when I'm having someone film for me, I, I mostly just go with it because I want to be nice to them. But then also, since this gun is going to be my main primary defensive firearm, I'm considering the fact that if I were to shoot this gun indoors, it's going to be loud regardless, but I have an option that's slightly less loud, slightly less concussive, slightly less disorienting. And now there's a whole conversation that can be had about people that have been in the military or people that have been in defensive situations where uh, the auditory occlusion kicks in and you don't notice that kind of stuff when your adrenaline's pumping, and that's fine. However, 
I can also set my gun up to just be a little bit less annoying to myself if I ever need to use it or to the people around me when I happen to just be shooting. An unsuppressed firearm inside the home is going to be really loud, and that's just something you have to consider. But for me, I don't necessarily need the performance benefits of a muzzle brake for the context of what I use this gun for. If it was going to be a competition gun, absolutely, I'd be throwing a muzzle brake on it, the most loud, obnoxious, effective muzzle brake I can get my hands on, and I would be having a much flatter shooting gun. But as you can see in the videos that I showed in the beginning, you don't necessarily need that. So let me know what you guys think down below. Is there anything that I missed? You guys know the drill. Have fun, be safe, stay dangerous. Peace.